Over the last year or so, this channel has seen a lot of builds, 13 to be exact. But when the Hardware Connects team got together at CES this year, we realized that there was a missing platform among all those systems. Somehow, Skylake X and the X299 platform were missing from our system setups. And yes, you guys called us out in the comments. You wanted to see what Intel's high-end desktop platform could offer. I didn't have all these Skylake X processors I wanted to test, so we reached out to Intel and they agreed to help us put together this video. Now before I get too far, I wanted to explain that my Skylake X journey is going to be spread across three videos, so you guys can actually follow along through the process. Uh, since I haven't built with X299 yet, this video is going to be a recap of my own research into the platform and its capabilities as I choose the right components that fit my needs. Uh, hopefully, a lot of information in the next few minutes will also help you make the right decisions as well. But remember, Skylark X is part of a flexible ecosystem that can offer you everything from an ultra high-end system to a compact ITX setup. So it was kind of love at first sight, you know? There's really nothing like this exterior. I love the metallic color, the tinted glass panel, the RGB fans at the front. It's basically a see-through case and who doesn't love that? Your graphics card can go vertical, the top is radiator friendly, and the right side is so unique when exposed thanks to these cable covers. So you can show off everything you've got with the H500P by Cooler Master. Check it out in the description below. Speaking of picking hardware, actually building the system and running benchmarks, that'll be done in the second video of the series. From there in video three, I have something a bit different planned with tricks that will get the most out of your systems with a huge number of processing threads. But the first thing I wanna talk about is the processors. And for those, I have to thank Intel because uh, without their support, none of this would have been possible. Sitting right at the top of Intel Skylark X lineup is the $2,000 i9-7980 Extreme Edition, which has 18 cores and 36 threads, making it the highest performance desktop processor available right now. It operates at a base clock of 2.6 GHz and can run its turbo frequency to 4.4 GHz. But Intel also gave all their high-end Skylake X processors a third gear with Turbo Boost Max 3.0 technology, which basically identifies cores within each CPU uh, that can run at a higher sustained frequency than the others. It will then take advantage of the thermal and power headroom to push speeds even higher. And in the case of the i9-7980XC, that means it can hit 4.6 GHz in the right conditions. Next is the i9-7960X, which goes for about $1,700 and features 16 cores with 32 threads, operating at a base clock of 2.8 GHz, a turbo of 4.2 GHz, and Turbo Boost 3.0 that could hit up to 4.4 GHz. The i9-7940X is a little bit expensive at $1,400. It has 28 threads that operate at a slightly higher frequency, but otherwise it has the same specifications as the other high-end Skylark X CPUs. To close out the i9 series, there's the i9-7920X, which has 12 cores and 24 threads, a base clock of 2.9 GHz, and a turbo frequency of 4.3 GHz and 4.4 GHz. Do note that it features a slightly lower TDP. Finally, there's the i9-7900X, a processor that a lot of you may be looking closely due to its price and large number of processing threads. What I like about this is its higher base and turbo 3.0 speeds, which should be a good fit for gaming scenarios, and it still has 44 PCI 3.0 lanes from the processor. The Skylake X family also has a bit more budget-friendly processors as well, and they could act as a great starting point for an impressive system based off the X299 platform. These are the i7-7820X and the i7-7800X. The 7820X uses 8 cores and 16 threads while running at the highest speeds of any Skylake X processor. Uh, one thing to take into account is that it only has 28 PCI 3.0 lanes, but that shouldn't be too much of a limitation unless you plan on running two GPUs or a whole array of NVMe SSDs. But then again, Epic setups are what Skylark X is meant for. At $389, the i7-7800X is the least expensive processor in this lineup. It has 12 threads and a respectable 3.5 GHz base clock, but its 4 GHz turbo speed is the lowest of the bunch, and unfortunately, there's no support for Turbo Boost Max 3.0. So I know that's a lot of information to digest, but it looks like Intel has hit every possible usage case scenario with these processors. I can't blame them either, since people have different needs. For example, if you're like me who needs to process parallel workloads like uh, rendering, gaming, and streaming at the same time, then something like this, the i9-7980 Extreme Edition processor could be a good fit. Sure, it may cost $2,000, but that cost could be justified for professionals 
who know that every minute counts in their workflow. Meanwhile, a processor like the i9-7900X combines pricing, the possibility of using up to 20 threads at higher frequencies, and I see this as a great option for someone who's on a, a smaller budget, uh, but most importantly, they can also get to experience great in-game frame rates. You see, these were all the things that went through my head as I was approaching on how to you know, put this build together because Fun fact, as I'm making this video, I still haven't decided on which CPU to choose. You know, should I go with the 18 core processor or maybe the 10 core CPU? Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely gonna be an interesting one for sure. Now, I also wanted to talk about motherboards since just like the processors, there are a ton of options at various price points and sizes and with different capabilities. Let's start with something that just arrived and it shows how versatile this platform is. So check this out. This is the ASRock X299E ITX slash AC and it's the smallest high-end desktop board currently available. When we first saw this board at CES, I was inspired to create something with it. ASRock has built a ton of features onto this board, like three NVMe M.2 slots, two USB 3.1 Gen 2 ports, uh, six SATA 6 ports, support for Optane technology, and a wireless AC module. But before thinking this board is for you, remember the limited space means many of X299's best features can't be included. For example, there's only a single PCIe X16 slot, so ultra-fast SSDs that needs a PCI slot, like Intel's own 900P series, can't be installed. SOTA memory needs to be used as well, so memory choices will be limited and they could potentially become expensive as well. I should also mention that the upcoming X299 ITX boards won't support overclocking on 165 watt CPUs or the 16 and 18 core Skylake X processors because of the limited space they have for the input power regulators. The ASRock board does support 18 core chips and can even overclock them, but you might need additional cooling on PWM so overheating doesn't happen, especially if you are using a liquid cooler. These X299 ITX boards will likely be a great fit for people who want to maximize CPU power in a compact case while running a single GPU, but what if you want to step up a bit? Well, that's where MATX boards come in. Right now, the ASRock X299 ITX AC is the only ultra small form factor motherboard available, and MATX options are also pretty limited. As a matter of fact, uh, there are very few micro ATX motherboards available for any platform right now. But this is the MSI X299M Gaming Pro Carbon AC, and even though that isn't too much larger than the ITX, it almost has all the features Intel Skylake X platform is known for. Almost. But not all, so there are still sacrifices you'll make if you want to use these processors in a more compact setup. Basically, on this board, when a 44-lane processor is installed, you get two full-speed X16 slots for dual graphics and a bottom-back slot that takes eight lanes. Since the board isn't that high, there's not enough space to install another GPU. Uh, there's also just four memory slots instead of the usual eight, which means the MSI X299M can only support up to 64 gigabytes of memory rather than 128 gigabytes. Storage has been limited too, since there are only two M.2 NVMe slots and no U.2 connector for Intel's high-speed SSD. But like I said, a lot of expansion can be done if you use the PCI slots. The MSI Micro ATX board isn't unique in these things either, so make sure you research smaller X299 boards before assuming that they will all have the features you want for X299. Now, if you want to get the absolute most out of X299 and don't want to worry about uh, your system's overall footprint, ATX and EATX boards will be the way to go. To be honest with you, there are many ATX motherboards that cost less than the Micro ATX and ITX options that I've talked about, but the smaller form factor designs have a premium for their compactness. I won't go through all the options here since right now there are about 50 different options in the ATX category alone, uh, but let me say this. If you have a specific set of needs and a set budget, there's likely an X299 board out there that will meet them. If you want durability and a huge number of options for professionals, uh, the ASUS WS series will have you covered. Everyone from Aorus to ASUS and MSI and ASRock have something for gamers, and there's even a huge number of budget-focused boards that cover necessities. Another big investment into any new system these days is memory. What you need here is a good quad channel memory kit. Uh, while you can use a dual channel setup on Skylake X, it isn't something that should be done since the negative performance impact can be huge. For example, I gave it a try in Adobe Premiere and my rendering times increased by almost 50% with a dual channel kit. So I would highly recommend going quad channel over dual channel for Skylake X. So guys, we know that Intel's high-end desktop platform needs quad-channel memory, but which kit should you choose? 
There are a ton of options, but they really boil down to what your needs are. Heavy multitasking will require a minimum of 32 gigabytes, while more intensive professional applications could even stress this platform to the 128 gigabyte limit. The memory frequency will also play a pretty big part in these things. For example, with 32 gigabytes of memory running at 2666 megahertz, I got an average of 170 frames per second with an average minimum of 135 frames per second. Switching to 3600 megahertz at the same timings boosted that to 188 frames per second with smoother minimums of 155. Even Adobe Premiere benefited from the faster memory, but not by much. Rendering a 1 minute 4K video went from 75 seconds at 2666 MHz to 70 seconds with the faster memory. Personally, I like the combination of speed and capacity for gaming and more professional tasks. That means a 32GB or 64GB kit that's as fast as I can afford will be amazing. Right now, the sweet spot seems to be a 32GB setup that runs at 3200 MHz, but that might change since RAM prices are all over the place these days. If you can afford the step up to 64 gigabytes at higher speeds, jump on it. Okay, so another challenge that I had when putting together my Skylake Kick system was figuring out the cooling situation. Now, while I won't recommend any specific models here, I can point you towards what I learned after testing a few processors at both stock and overclock settings. Uh, so basically, the i7-7800 models can be easily handled by a single all-in-one liquid uh, cooling solution or a uh, basic tower-style heatsink. Even a bit of overclocking shouldn't be a problem, uh, provided you keep the voltage under 1.2 volts. But remember that Skylake X builds up heat faster as you increase the voltage and the clock speeds, especially on i9 CPUs. So that's something to keep in mind when you consider overclocking these processors. And those i9 processors need some pretty substantial cooling in just their stock form. I would recommend at the minimum a large tower style heatsink or dual fan all-in-one solution if you intend on even a small overclock or running at stock frequencies. Aiming for even higher speeds uh, and voltage increases temperatures output like crazy. So for serious overclocking, you should think about triple bay AIOs or building a custom water cooling loop. My big word of advice here is to not underestimate Skylake X's ability to push out heat and upsize your cooling solution. So by now we learned that Skylake X is a serious performer, but we also learned that cooling these processors is just as important because uh, if you're planning on overclocking these processors, you want to make sure that the temperatures are well within reach. Uh, one more thing that needs to be taken into account is the power supply because they play a huge role uh, when it comes to powering these CPUs. So, these processors are actually very efficient from a uh, performance per watt standpoint, uh, but the sheer number of cores means power consumption is something to take note of. For my build, I ended up following a pretty simple strategy. If I was going to use one of the 18, 16, or 14 core processors, along with two graphics cards and a few storage drives, I wanted at least a 900 watt PSU, or maybe a bit more, since overclocking could push input needs even further. That may seem like an overkill, but I would want to have some breathing room for upgrades sometime down the road as well. Choosing one of the other Skylake CPUs like the 7920X or below with a single high-end graphics card would lower my needs to about 650 watts. Meanwhile, that setup with a second GPU would likely need about 800 watts to be safe and allow for overclocking as well. So there you guys have it. That's my little journey through researching and doing a bit of testing with Skylake X. The only thing that's left to do is pick the components and proceed with the build. Uh, but as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, that will be in the second video of this series. So stay tuned for that. I'll also be comparing some rendering results to my current workstation PC featuring the Ryzen 7 1700X. But most importantly, I'll be fine tuning the components in this upcoming X299 build to give me a better editing experience because Currently, my main PC is giving me a lot of issues, especially when editing the video. So definitely stay tuned for part two. I'm Ivo with Hurricane X. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one.